1933, as Hitler's Nazi party rose to power in Germany, the Jewish artist Marc Chagall painted solitude. In the foreground, a seated man sits wrapped in a tallit or prayer shawl. His right hand supports his head in an attitude of contemplation, and his left arm embraces a large Torah scroll. At his side, a heifer seems to be playing a violin. In the background, the city of Vitebsk, where Chagall was born and raised, is surrounded in darkness and watched over by an angel. At the time he painted this, Chagall was working obsessively on a commission to illustrate the Old Testament, while also keenly aware of the looming clouds of Nazi anti-Semitism. In the midst of these unsettling political developments, Chagall drew on the Jewish tradition of deep, loving attention to the scriptures. The violin playing cow is an image of the imaginative, artistic meditation on the divine word being practiced by the man cradling the Torah scroll. Why a cow? Because the Hebrew word Hagah, like the Latin and English word ruminate, means both to meditate, but also to chew the cud. David Lyle Jeffrey links Chagall's painting to this trope, explaining that by analogy with the peaceable heifer, a spiritually flourishing person is said to be one who meditates on the word of God day and night. One of the iconic Old Testament passages that relies on this wordplay is Psalm 1, where the blessed man delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The result of this meditation is not just some kind of personal enrichment. The psalmist compares the person who ruminates on God's word to a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. The result of scriptural rumination is fruit that blesses one's place and community. The rooted life of the blessed man contrasts with the ungodly, who are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. These chaff-like fools are blown about by the latest fads and trends, and in this way, they are like those with macadamized minds. A Christian image for healthy attention, then, might be this rooted tree or a violin playing heifer. Chagall's seated figure gestures toward a kind of contemplative politics, to use a phrase that may seem paradoxical. A contemplative politics entails a two-part movement, one that parallels Thoreau's injunction to be wary of trivia and devoted to eternal truths. So the first movement entails an ascesis, a kind of self-discipline that refuses attention to the buzzing alerts and urgent headlines that threaten to macadamize our minds. A helpful guide in this endeavor is the French mathematician and theologian Blaise Pascal, who shows how a confidence in God's providence can free us from seeing the news as a series of reports on existential crises and can enable us to cultivate a holy apathy, a sancta indifferentia, toward this temporal frenzy. The second movement entails loving action rooted in contemplation of God and his word. The 20th century Trappist monk Thomas Merton serves as a helpful example in this regard. He detached himself from the daily scrum in order to devote himself more deeply to a few particularly important issues, such as race relations and interreligious dialogue. And his work on these subjects flowed from a prayerful contemplation of scripture and God's presence. Loving attention to the divine word should result in profound love for those with whom we share our place and time. In conclusion, I'll mention two practices that might help us adopt this posture in our current media context, the posture of a tree rooted in God's eternal word. But to begin, holy apathy. In the mid 17th century, Blaise Pascal wrote a letter to his brother-in-law in which he reflects on the nature of political controversies. His recommendations are broadly applicable to the way in which we engage the myriad social and political dramas that fill the news. Pascal's brother-in-law wrote him about a controversy in which he was involved, and Pascal replies by sketching out his view of divine providence as guiding not only our efforts, but also those of our opponents. As Pascal writes, the same providence that has inspired some with light has refused it to others. In other words, the God that allows you to have the right perspective on this particular issue also allows others to be wrong about it. Recognizing that the outcome of all our controversies is in God's hand, and that in some sense he wills or permits people to hold different views on these issues, should radically temper our emotional investment in the victory of our preferred side. Such a recognition, recognition would certainly dampen the fury with which Christians often fight culture wars. 
The upshot then is that Pascal recommends a profound sort of apathy, a holy indifference toward the outcome of the issues we read about and advocate for. This indifference is rooted in a, in a confidence that God is in control and in a humility about our own ability to discern the workings of providence in contemporary events. God often accomplishes his providential purposes in ways we don't expect. So we shouldn't be too quick to rejoice over what seems like a positive development or to despair over what seems like bad news. Further, as we'll discuss more later, we should be very cautious to claim that we can recognize exactly what God might be doing in any given situation. For instance, Jeremiah declares the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar to be the servant of the Lord. And Isaiah calls King Cyrus of Persia the Lord's anointed. Plainly, God can appoint pagan rulers to carry out his purposes, purposes that remain opaque and surprising to God's own people. Of course, the most obvious example of the unpredictable workings of providence is the passion and death of Jesus. Jesus' own disciples certainly thought these events constituted unmitigated bad news. And yet, we call this Friday good. As one of G.K. Chesterton's protagonists declares, the cross cannot be defeated, for it is defeat. Epistemic humility, particularly regarding the workings of divine providence, requires us to acknowledge that even when our candidate loses, or when a court case is decided in a way that seems wrong to us, or when tragedy strikes, God is still working out his will, and he cannot be defeated. And the reverse holds true as well. It may be that just when we think we're winning, we're actually going astray from God's kingdom. So a high view of divine providence and a chastened sense of our ability to recognize God's methods of victory frees us from worrying about whether a given event is good or bad. Because even when the events of the news seem unredeemable evil, they remain under the hand of the Creator, who is working all things according to His plan. So the goal of Sancta Indifferentia is faithful action that's not concerned with the results. Thoreau actually stands as a good example here. For all his talk about attending to the mountain brooks, the Parnassian streams, he involved himself personally in many social and political events. Besides helping escape slaves to freedom and going to jail over his refusal to pay taxes that would support what he thought was an unjust war, his speech passionately defending John Brown after the failed Harper's Ferry raid changed the tide of public sentiment and galvanized support for abolition. His essay on civil disobedience inspired and informed subsequent generations of protesters, including Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Thoreau's posture of indifference to trivial dramas enabled him to discern how he should respond to the more fundamental currents of his time. As Thoreau wrote to a friend shortly after the outbreak of the Civil War, the most fatal and indeed the only fatal weapon you can direct against evil ever is to ignore it. For as long as you know of it, you are a partner in crime. What business have you, if you are an angel of light, to be pondering over the deeds of darkness, reading the New York Herald and the like? Blessed were the days before you read a president's message. Thoreau, like Pascal, knew that reveling in the day's political news, news about which he could do nothing, would only distract and disturb him without improving the situation in the slightest. So when we scroll through our news feed each morning to see if our side of a particular issue is winning, we betray a lack of trust in God's providence. Of course, this is not the only way to engage the news. We can also rely on the news to form our judgment and guide our actions in response to contingent political or social matters. And such use of the news is entirely congruent with a Pascalian holy apathy. So if that's the, the negative movement, the movement away from the news, here's the positive movement. Uh, and we'll look at Thomas Merton in this regard. Rightly oriented attention to the news has these two movements, right? Um, and if Pascal helps us understand the need to turn away from the drama offered by the news as scoreboard, perhaps the life and writings of the Trappist monk Thomas Merton can guide us as we consider how we should positively direct our attention. Merton lived as a hermit during the last few years of his life, but he remained deeply invested in the social issues of his day. As a contemplative monk, Merton devoted much of his time to practices that disciplined his attention. And by setting down the telescope proffered by the news media and turning his attention to his inner life, he turned also from the branches of evil, its distant and obvious symptoms, to its roots gripping his own soul. His writings turned again and again to his profound sense of complicity in the great evils of his day. 
One might think that a monk in Kentucky would have no responsibility for the rise of Nazism in Europe or the insidious rot of racism that the civil rights movement brought to light. But instead of casting blame on others, Merton sought to understand the ways in which he himself participated in these wrongs. This awareness blossoms in an interior silence that requires a certain degree of exterior silence. Merton states flatly that Christians should have quiet homes and beware of the TV and the radio with their incessant chatter. As he puts it, those who love God should attempt to preserve or create an atmosphere in which he can be found. The point of this ascesis is an interior silence. But as Merton writes, just as interior asceticism cannot be acquired without concrete and exterior mortification, so it is absurd to talk about interior silence when there is no exterior silence. Merton isn't recommending that we ignore everything that's going on in the world. Rather, he's worried that we surround ourselves with noise in order to distract ourselves from those motives and desires at the ground of our being. A world of propaganda, of endless argument, vituperation, criticism, or simply of chatter is a world without anything to live for, he writes. When we carve out space in which to be silent, we find ourselves confronted by what, is, by what in fact we are living for, and we may not be flattered by what we discover. As Thoreau warned, flitting from one news tidbit to the next induces mental dyspepsia. And yet, Merton does not recommend simply abstaining from the news. In fact, he explicitly warns that we must avoid a succession into individualistic concern with one's own salvation alone, because this may in fact lead, leave the way all the more open for unscrupulous men and groups to gain and wield unjust power. So instead of a turning away from the world, Merton's contemplative silence creates the interior space necessary to discern the particular issues to which we may be called to attend and respond. This silence is essential to maintaining our freedom to hear God's call and then participate in his redemptive work. Merton's approach to the news then entails focused attention to particular topics. We can't, indeed we shouldn't, be informed about everything, but to what issues might God be calling us to attend? Our aim, as Merton puts it, should be to listen to the voice of God in the events of the time and then faithfully obey. In Merton's case, his efforts to listen to the voice of God led him toward issues such as racial injustice, nuclear proliferation, and interreligious dialogue. He wrote and worked seriously in response to these social issues. For Merton then, pursuing a contemplative life and pursuing temporal justice are inseparable. As Henry Nouwen noted, the great power of Merton as a writer still remains in his ability to comment on the concrete happenings of the day and to do this out of a contemplative silence. If more Christians would approach the news from this place of contemplative silence, of deeply rooted faith in God's redemptive work and eventual victory, the church's witness would shine more brightly amidst the chaotic noise of the daily news. As Chagall's meditative figure reminds us, Christians should be wary of being caught up in the trivia of the day and should be devoted to eternal truths. I wanna conclude this lecture and this, this two-part section on attention by suggesting two practices that might help us cultivate this posture of a tree rooted in God's eternal word. The first is kind of boring, simply to spend more time reading old, long stuff and less time reading short, new stuff. As Thoreau puts it, read not the times, read the eternities. If this was wise advice in the mid 19th century, it's even more important for those of us who inhabit a digital media ecosystem. One way to understand the stakes is to put Thoreau's advice in terms of his dietetic metaphor. We should avoid marshmallows and eat vegetables. Hot takes and clickbait, TV news broadcasts, which are often basically just comedy shows, and the one-liners that populate social media feeds are easy to consume, but they leave us bloated. If we want to attend to the needs of our neighbors, we'll need a more robust diet of thoughtful journalism, long form essays, and books. There's really no good reason to get your news from TV. Doing so is more likely to turn you into a macadamized spectator than it is to equip you to be a healthy participant in the public sphere. Even TED Talks are just highbrow forms of intellectual candy. Macaroons say to broadcast TV's Tootsie Rolls. These mediums privilege entertainment rather than contemplation. But the good news is that if our tastes have been malformed, if we have a craving for the salts and fats of junk food news, we can begin to change our cravings by changing what we consume. 
As John Somerville puts it, right now your brain is like a sieve with the news pouring through. Start reading something substantial and you'll lose all interest in watching journalists write in the sand. Most people who have stopped drinking soda or given up other junk food can attest that in just a few weeks or months, their cravings for these foods go away. Our tastes are trainable. Thus it is that the injunction to read books shouldn't be seen as some dreary, moralistic advice to eat your peas and carrots. Rather, we should see Thoreau's advice as analogous to one of those cookbooks with lots of appealing pictures of home-cooked meals. Their aim is to make us realize that fresh vegetables can actually taste better than junk food. Perhaps the best way to begin retraining our tastes is to identify the contemporary topics that attract our attention, those that, as Merton writes, announce our hour of vocation, and then go in search of older books that will deepen our understanding of these topics. These longer essays and older books act as a kind of ballast, helping us better discern which new headlines are actually significant. My second suggestion is to learn a craft. Writers from Kathleen Norris to Alex Langlands have demonstrated the power of mundane work, the ongoing work of caring for people and objects and all their intractable materiality to shape our souls. When we grapple with physical reality, we become responsible, able to respond to the needs of those around us. Cooking meals, building wooden furniture, growing a garden may not seem relevant to how we consume the news, but such activities train us to attend to the world in restorative, redemptive ways. I mentioned earlier that Joseph Pieper suggests that those who have lost the power to see clearly should abstain from the visual noise of daily inanities at a distance. And it goes on to offer this advice. A better and more immediately effective remedy is this, to be active oneself in artistic creation, producing shapes and forms for the eye to see. Artistic or artisanal work requires close attention. As people writes, the mere attempt, therefore, to create an artistic form compels the artist to take a fresh look at the visible reality. It requires authentic and personal observation. It's in this way that artistic making trains us to relate to the world as those who tend and create rather than as those who spectate and consume. Indeed, in a profound way, the loving attention of a human maker parallels the creator's love for creation. If our souls have become warped by attending to distant spectacles or by obsessing about the outcome of dramas over which we have no control, the discipline of learning a craft can be a vital antidote. Perhaps the news to which we most need to attend won't be found on social media feeds or the front page of any paper. Instead, it's the cry of a baby who needs her diaper changed. It's the bubbles bursting from a pot that needs to be stirred. It's the ripple of wood grain we have to accommodate in shaping a handle. These are the news alerts, the push notifications to which we can respond with loving skill. And such work inculcates a properly responsible attention, an attention that seeks to lovingly care for the needs at hand. This is the kind of attention that enables us to responsibly love our neighbors. Thank you.